the, the Northerners dream of a Republican South based on black votes will simply uh, never come to be. The Redeemers, uh, well, it'll turn Republican in the 60s, but not because of black votes by any stretch. Uh, the, the South soon fell back under control of the same people who had controlled it before. They called themselves the Redeemers or the Bourbons after the, the French ruling uh, uh, elite. They were planters joined by merchants, industrialists, financiers, and railroad men. They believed in the idea of home rule, that states should get to decide for themselves what they're going to do. They became intensely socially conservative, uh, deeply religious uh, in, in their politics as well as their, their daily lives. Uh, but they also turned towards economic development. They began to understand that the South couldn't remain an agriculture economy forever. They began to t cut taxes and shrink the government. There's a tremendous bitterness towards government, as you can imagine. And in fact, uh, they eliminated public schooling as part of their kind of anti-government measures. Some Southerners began to embrace ideas of thrift, industry, and progress, meaning uh, uh, kind of uh, what the Northerners considered to be work, uh, which, of course, Southerners had previously rejected. Manufacturing began to appear in the South, particularly textiles, which makes sense because they had all the cotton, right? Textiles is cloth. It was, it was run by water power, cheap labor, low taxes, and a business-friendly government. Tobacco and iron will also become significant industries, particularly uh, iron, particularly in uh, Alabama. From 1880 to 1890, the amount of railroad track doubles in the South. In 1886, the South adopts the Northern Railroad gauge, how wide the tracks are apart. The South used to have its own gauge, you know, because they couldn't do anything the North wanted. Uh, but when they adopt the Northern gauge, it's going to help their economy. Between 1880 and 1900, uh, manufacturing doubles in the South from 5% of all U.S. manufacturing to 10%. So it's still a minor part, but it is growing. Per capita income is going to go up from 21% of the North to 40% of the North. Uh, so again, they're still a lot poor in the North, but it's getting better. In 18, uh, before the war, by the way, uh, per capita income of the South had been 60% of the North. Uh, but the capital was Northern. The companies who are opening these businesses are Northern companies, so the profits flow out of the South back to the North. Factories were manned by women. Why? Well, the men were dead. They died in the Civil War. They were severely handicapped. Um, they would work 12 hours a day for tiny wages. The mill owners would control the entire town. Unions were not allowed. Workers were forced to buy from company stores at extremely inflated prices. So the, uh, the, 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 by the time you got your paycheck, you owed it all to the company store before you never even saw money. Mill owners refused to allow competing merchants to come in and, and uh, open up stores, so there were monopolies on everything. Some industries hired blacks, others did not. Tobacco, iron, and lumber would hire black workers. Blacks and whites began living and working side by side in mill towns. And really a lot of these old racist ideas began to disappear among the poor because when you work next to people, things happen. You might become friends. Uh, boys and girls might hook up. I mean, this stuff happens. And so we begin to see, particularly among the poor, uh, an eroding of these racial distinctions. Agriculture declines in the South. Foreign markets have turned elsewhere. There's just not as many people buying. Absentee ownerships of many plantations is a problem as well because if the owner's never around, he's not there to keep them up, and they become less and less productive. There's a lack of diversification. They're still committed to cotton when they probably should have started to grow other things. Um, during Reconstruction, uh, uh, or by 1900, 70% of southern land is being worked by tenant farmers. Blacks also came to believe in this new South. Blacks bought into this. They, they thought that they would recreate the South in a way that was friendlier to blacks. They would work to get off the farm and into business. Uh, they dreamed of opening up a store or a factory or something like that. Black colleges have spread across the South, as we know. And, and, and the main figure of this, the iconic figure of this, is Booker T. Washington. Booker T. preaches to African Americans that hard work and education is the path to equality, not political agitation. Uh, for, he's a former slave. He got his degree at Virginia's Hampton Institute, and he founded, uh, along with others, the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. He has a cautious path of self-improvement. He says, if we make ourselves worthy of success in the white world, then we will find success in the white world. You don't demand it. You don't go out and demand political equality. You show white people that you can contribute, and then they'll let you contribute. He urges black to focus on industrial and agricultural education. Don't go be a lawyer. Don't try to be a college professor. Learn useful skills, skills that will help you in business. He also tells blacks they need to speak better and dress better. He believes personal hygiene is the key. His dream is that blacks can win the respect of whites. 
uh, that black people will lift themselves up and whites will no longer be able to see them as inferior. In 1895, in a famous speech in Atlanta we call the Atlanta Compromise, he rejects political agitation and a struggle for civil rights. He accepts segregation as a normal part of society, and he argues that freedom will come one day once African Americans have found economic success. If, if you're not in my class particularly, you might pause it here and read this quote. Uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. This is from Booker T. Washington. After being abandoned by the North in 1877, Southern blacks are defenseless. In 1833, the courts rule the 14th Amendment does not apply to private citizens or businesses, um, which means that, that private citizens and business can discriminate and deny things to black people all they want. In 1896, the court upholds state laws enforcing segregation, saying that states can segregate people. This is Plessy v. Ferguson. Uh, 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 this is a, and, and coming via, uh, I'm sorry, in Plessy, a man who's 1 16th black is forced to ride in a Negro car on a train, they called it at the time. Uh, and he argues that this is discrimination. It's not equal protection under the law. And the court says that there can be separate facilities as long as they're equal. Well, they're not equal, but the court doesn't care. In Cumming v. County Board of Education, 1899, white-only schools are allowed, even in a town with no black schools at all. So you don't have to even provide schools for blacks. Some states stripped the right to vote away. Uh, they did this through things like grandfather clauses and, and poll taxes. Others tried to manipulate blacks to keep poor whites in check. By 1890s, the Bourbons feared the poor whites and blacks might team up in a class war instead of a race war. Uh, by the end of the decade, the black vote is down 62 percent, um, and so these attempts to prevent black people from exercising political authority work. Jim Crow laws are what we call these laws enforcing segregation. Everything was segregated, even public facilities, uh, bathrooms, water fountains, as you guys know, restaurants, everything was segregated. Uh, lynching became common. An average of 187 African Americans were lynched a year. Eighty percent of those were in the South, which is important to note 20 percent were in the North. It was seen by whites as a legitimate form of law enforcement, and it was a public spectacle. People came out uh, from all over the place um, uh, to, uh, to, to watch these. They would advertise them. They would put flyers up. You would bring your kids out. It was a picnic. You might even get to go up, and you and your kids might even get to go up and put a few bullets in the black man after he had been killed. This is a way of controlling blacks through terror. You're going to speak up. You're going to fight back. Well, this is what's going to happen to you. Um, and incidentally, they didn't care if they went to, to, uh, uh, to avenge a crime. They didn't care if you were the person who did it or not. If you were black and they get their hands on you, that was enough. Ida B. Wells is a black female reporter who becomes famous after publishing a series of articles after three of her friends are lynched, and she launches a national anti-lynching movement, and she begins demanding an anti-lynching law, a federal anti-lynching law. This is finally going to come, but it's going to be decades and decades before we get this thing. Racism in the South, here's a chart showing the number of uh, 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 blacks um, uh, murdered uh, by decade uh, in lynchings. Racism in the South helped the rich white ruling class, the Bourbons, by turning poor white anger against the blacks. In reality, the poor blacks and the poor whites should have united. They had more in common than they did different. But racism was so strong that a poor white man did not see the landowner who was oppressing him because he was a sharecropper as his enemy. He saw the black guy who was his neighbor as his enemy, even though they were in reality in the exact same position. But ultimately, Reconstruction does fail. Uh, it's going to be 100 years before we can even begin to get it right with the Civil Rights Movement.